we want to talk today about uh, if you can put a price tag on open source. Um, yeah, this is Bob. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Bob Killen. I am known as Mr. Bobby Tables across all the things. I currently work for the CNCF as a technical program manager, but I have uh, quite a few years of experience in open source. I was previously at Google, Emeritus Kubernetes Steering Committee, and uh, Emeritus Chair uh, Kubernetes Sync Contributor Experience. Yeah, hi, I'm Mario. I um, work for Kubernetes as a customer delivery architect. Um, what this is, I don't know. We ask an AI what I do, and this came up as a title. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but I do also stuff in SIG Contrib X and SIG Kates Infra for the Kubernetes project. And yeah, so the question has been asked uh, can we put a price tag on open source? The good thing is, yes, we can. And that's the price tag. So we, it's $8.8 .8 trillion. Um, this was basically calculated by some folks in the beginning of the year. They published a paper uh, at the Harvard Business School. And yeah, that's basically what they came up with. They used Kokomo 2 as a method and just went over all of the open source projects. And thanks for you for being here. That's the talk. See you so, later. <laughs> <laughs> However, is this true? Obviously, it's not, right? You, you cannot put the direct price tag. We, can, we have some ways to calculate stuff. Um, we want shortly to dig a little bit into how Kubernetes would fall into this number pool. So uh, we dug up some um, statistics. Uh, the statistics in this case are from the Open Hub. Um, they, um, that's also not 100% true because they don't count every repository that we have in the Kubernetes project. There are some, some hiccups, but it's a number where we can basically go into this direction and have a look at it. And what we see is based on the numbers that we get, we have like 15,000 contributors, uh, these 64 million lines of code. And uh, we basically figured out that Kubernetes is would cost this much money to build currently. Um, Bob went beyond, uh, above and beyond to calculate what would be like the mediocre salary across the world for a Go developer that would work in this space. And we, uh, we basically found that that's, it's $88,000. Um, but that's only based on the Kokomo method. And we are missing a lot of stuff when we are only looking at lines of code uh, in, the, in the calculation because there are a ton of pieces that are not tracked inside of a project, right? So we have a lot of stuff that have like meetings. When you go to uh, kdesk.dev and uh, have a look at how many meetings do we have in the calendar per week, we come to roughly 32 meetings. And then you basically say like, in those meetings, there are five people. Uh, in normal, but it, this is also time that, uh, that's, uh, that needs to be taken care of. We have governance and policies. For example, we published a policy for the usage of our Kubernetes IOX account. Um, yes, you can find it in the code. So we have the lines of code for this policy, but what is not in, uh, in there is like five people reviewing the policy uh, in a Google Doc before we even first open the pull request. So these are like things that are not taken account for. We have a huge chunk of infrastructure. So for example, we, uh, we are going to spend around $2 million uh, in infrastructure in AWS this year. We are close to $1.7 million in GCP. We will, uh, I, have, I haven't even calculated Fastly because Fastly we, we are just have like the amount of traffic that we generate there. So we have a ton of money that, that this project needs just to run its infrastructure. Actually, other quick thing besides all things covered here, the Kokomo method that's used for calculating stuff is literally only used to look at what it takes to get from zero to that many lines of code. So it doesn't take into account all the issues, all the other things around it. It doesn't take into account um, for the, like other sort of non-code pieces is like all the time actually spent uh, reviewing and doing design proposals before they get into GitHub. Like there's a lot more that's not accounted for there. Yeah, and that's 
things that also add up and needs to be taken care of. So we are facing problems within the Kubernetes project and not many people talk about problems. Um, so when we take a look at the last 12 months, we are down by 9% of commits. So we have less people that are doing stuff. We, have, um, we are down by 6% in active contributors that are actually committing. So we, we lose people that are working on the project. And um, we need nine days more to basically from opening a PR to merging a PR. And this also makes everything slow because the project is, as you imagine, it's a huge project, right? There's a lot of stuff that needs to take into account of, and it's really hard also to onboard people. And um, when you talk to people, when you go around and then you say like, hey, do you want to work in open source? Do you, or do you want to contribute to an open source project? They want to do this. So we have numbers where basically that we can prove that people want to work in open source and still we are losing contributors <coughs> left and right. So Google actually did a study in uh, 2023 sort of seeing, <coughs> sorry, looking at uh, polling contributors to see if they're contribute just during business hours for their job, just during you know, um, off hours for themselves. And it turns out that 52% of them are doing both. And if you take into that, plus the like, people that are <coughs> sorry, um, contributing for their job, that's actually like <coughs> about 80%. And that's a pretty significant amount of people that are at least doing something for their job. So the, the general thing is like, we have a lot of people, thank you, that do want to contribute. Most people want to contribute to open source. The big thing, most people like contributing to open source. There's lots of studies for that. The big thing is they want to get paid for it. They want to, you know, do it as part of a job and not be constantly crammed for like, you know, having to shift to something that is theoretically more impact internally when they understand that it is a significant value contributing upstream. Yeah. So. The problem is basically we know as developers or as engineers what we want to get out of open source, right? They are, everyone has their, their own idea. So, and that's something that maybe is also um, asked yourself, what do you really want to have out of open source? For example, some people say, I do it for fun because I like the community. Some people say, I'm a student, and we have this a lot, uh, especially with students. They want to take like open source as like a career booster to get into more pro uh, or to get better jobs in the end. The problem with this is then, what is next when they got the career? Do they drop out of open source? Will they still retain? And these are all valid points. There's nothing against that you say like I want to use open source contributions as a jump starter to get into uh, into get better projects. However, we need to ask companies what they want to get out of open source because that's the most important question because they will they pay our jobs they pay uh, they, they pay the projects because someone needs to pay because open source is not free it's not free source right it's open source so what do vendors want to get out of contributing to open source so we basically we look at this from two perspectives so um, I work for a vendor company so we are a cloud native vendor and we do uh, we have products in in uh, in the cloud native world uh, and there we basically have different folks in our company that want different things so when we go ahead and say like okay what are the per the people inside of a company <clears throat> and what the do what is their goal for the company and what is their goal for the job that they are doing and um we already clarified, as by the, the survey that Google did, is developers want to do contribute to open source and want to get, want to get paid for it. That's, that's clear. However, this doesn't match with what the leadership team uh, or other, uh, other parts of the company want, right? So the leadership team is basically there to 
create a business out of it to make sure that the company runs healthy, that the company is growing and that they have as less risk as possible to run. And this is probably one of the most important parts because eventually if you want to move or to have open source done by your company, you need to convince the leadership team that it is, it counts towards those goals that they have in their, in their process. Um, we also have two other personas in this whole thing. So we also need to, we also have like product owners. So for in, in our case, we are a product company, as I mentioned. So there's an interest from our product owners that the technology that we, or the product that they produce that maybe rely on open source is also like benefiting from an open source strategy because there we, the argument there would be like, if I have open source contributions, my, my product can benefit by doing those contributions. And then we have, and that's probably the most difficult role, middle management, because they have two, they, they, are, they have two jobs. One, they need to fulfill the, the goals from leadership and from product management. And second, they need to retain, retain people. You, they, their job is that they have to keep like people in the company that they can work on the product, that the company can sell it. So they are like in, in between and they need to, uh, and they need to basically take care of both sides. And this is really, really, really hard. So we basically need to filled into the, the point what be, are the benefits that we, that we can get out of open source. And for this we have the best thing is, or the main thing is employee re recruitment. We hired this year five people. We didn't spend a single dollar in uh, recruitment companies. We just let our people that are, all of our engineers are working in op uh, on open source. Uh, and we just let them post on LinkedIn, we are hiring. That's it. We got so many applications that we basically could choose who, could, uh, who will work for us. So we basically saved money um, instead of yeah, giving it to recruitment companies. We have an increased brand reputu reputation because people come to us and say like, you are the ones that are contributing to Kubernetes, right? So, or you are the ones that are you are contributing to KCP. You are the ones that are uh, contributing to Kubeword. We trust you because we know that you can fix stuff where we don't have the knowledge about it. Um, the good thing is also because of contributing to open source, we get all of the inputs from the other companies that are also working in open source because I must admit I'm friends with a lot of folks that are working for direct competitors. Actually, who here is friends with someone else that works at a competitor? <laughs> yes. So basically, that's that's also like you you get you you trigger yourself like it's uh, it's a friendly uh, it's a friendly competition, but you also get the insights out of it, and it's also a risk reduction because you have more people to test the stuff that you use than you would have as you, when you just build it for yourself. And there are even, there are even numbers to back this up. So um, Red Hat, and again, I use a study from a competitor. Um, they asked 2022, a lot of folks uh, regarding like, would you buy from a company that is mostly doing open source? And 82% of all of the IT leaders said that, I would rather go with a vendor that is actively um, contributing to open source um, than basically going for a company that only does yeah. private stuff. I think is like they surveyed like uh, CIOs and like CTOs, and so like th they even understand that level that there's a benefit from it, and not even you know looking at lower where you tend to get like more of the managers and directors who would consider that a benefit. Yeah, and the good thing is. They also asked like, why? Why do you why do you contribute or why do you choose this this open source companies? And they say like, they are familiar with uh, with the op open source process. Like, how does it go? How do fixes work? Um, they want to help to sustain an open and healthy open source community, 
because this is also helping them to say like, we have more input from different sides. And um, we also, they also know that they, they have a bigger pool of people to face issues and problems. However, what a lot of companies fail, and that's the main point is, they are not talking about their open source engagement. And it's all about marketing, because if you, good, if you do good things, then you need to talk about it. And I'm really sorry, but I need to do this now. This is our sales slide. So this is the first slide in every pitch deck that we have um, when we talk to customers. And um, our main message there is, we do open source. We are one of the companies that know the most about open uh, or the most about open source contribution in Europe. I mean, it's a bold claim, but the idea is we also put in ways how to prove it. So, for example, every one of you and every company of you can use dev sets because all of the CNCF contributions are tracked in dev sets. Uh, the only thing that you need to do is you need to ping your engineers because they might not be assigned to the correct update company. Their affiliation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So to update the aff uh, affiliation, <clears throat> but this helps you. And we also do like we we take the the industry certificates that are around and market with them because that's the the main thing that convinces our customers next to the product is like. Those people know what they are doing because they're doing it also in the open source space. And that's the, the most important thing is that you basically talk about this and market this. And um, I, I would say that most of the open source projects will not say no if, they are, uh, if you as a company ask them, hey, can we do an hour block like uh, testimonial or stuff like this? Because the open source project is also benefiting from this. Right? So what we need is we basically need a, a strategy, an open source strategy for every company um, that also working in open source. So, and the most important thing, as we stated before, is we need to get a leadership team involved. Um, we also need to explain to the outside world and to the inside of the company how our open source strategy is. And we basically need to talk to all of the different departments because as we heard, we need to talk to the marketing team to market our open source thing. We need to talk to HR because HR needs to or wants to recruit people and they also will benefit from this. Um, we basically need to, to get the buy-in from the different folks throughout the company so that all of the company is seeing like there's value in working with open source. And the other thing is, this was for a vendor company. But we also have different things than vendors. We also have <coughs> end user companies. And you saw it in yesterday's keynote with the end user awards. They are also now starting ramping up in open source. Yep. So end users also have needs. And honestly, they can also get a pretty big return from both using and contributing to open source. And just like vendors, it really starts with figuring out sort of your goals. What do you want out of, get it, out of it? What do you want to get out of contributing to open source? But when it comes to like general overall benefits, it's pretty much the same thing. So the benefits are the same. It's just sort of different priorities. And I'll actually break these down a little bit more in more detail. So whoops, open, uh, open software. Development is like you know public by default, um, which is, helps with increasing transparency and trust. And technical consumers really prefer brands that engage with open source. Studies have shown uh, that extends past your, the vendors um, and actually does extend to you know end user companies. It creates a sense uh, that your company is being more transparent in keeping up to date on technology trends. And then also on the recruitment side. Uh, there have been multiple other studies that show engineers prefer working for organizations that encourage OS OSS engagement. I mean, again, we saw that study from Google earlier. Other things is like employees generally just feel more fulfilled uh, when they get the opportunity to contribute to um, something upstream. It connects them sort of like with a greater ecosystem. It's also honestly like a great place uh, for people to build deeper knowledge and understanding of the tooling that you are using in your stack. 
you know, not to mention it also gives you access to a larger pool of people that will have built skills and depth of knowledge in that space. So the, it also really helps with um, essentially like on-ramp time. So if you are potentially hiring someone and there was a uh, study done, not on open source, but on general software development, that if you hire a sort of a skilled developer that is already versed in it, it cuts your on-ramp time by, down by about 70%. So where you might have to spend like a year potentially on-ramping someone to become like very fluent in a thing, you've cut that down to now just a couple months. And honestly, most of that's probably gonna be learning your internal stuff. So next is speed of innovation. When you work upstream and develop with a larger community, you have access to a lot more minds. You're part of, a, a, like say, a co-op uh, for the project that you all want to see sort of become better. You know, an open source project can work a lot faster than a vendor or inner source, at least when they're not bike shedding at something. So on the technical influence side, the more you are present in a project, the more you can actually influence its direction. You can directly impact the roadmap. And you know, honestly, projects get very little real feedback from users um, and they really value meaningful feedback. Like I think on the last um, Kubernetes SIG architecture survey, they got like, it was, it was something small, it was like 35 responses. And that was trying to go out to all outlets. And so if you are involved in a project, you, your voice has weight. Like it, it is very, very useful. Also, while this is like anecdotal, um, but honestly shouldn't be a surprise, um, if you are active in a community, your issues and PRs will get reviewed and merged faster uh, than if you're not active in a project because you've built up that trust. And people sort of will know that when you do open something, um, it's likely real and actually complete, and they have to spend a lot less time triaging it. Now I'd like to dive into some of the uh, meaty things, and that's risk reduction. So everyone has their own tolerance for risk, but you and your organization can directly decrease the risk of the projects you are using by getting involved. It doesn't have to be SWEs or you know, software engineers. Projects need things like project management, comms and marketing, um, just generally tech writing. And these things may not directly contribute to code, but they can keep the project healthy. And if you're talking about wanting to de-risk something that you are actively using, that is very, very helpful. So these non-code contributions can actually bring in you know, new contributors to help make the project more sustainable. It can help with adoption. Um, actually, like one of the big things around like um, marketing in docs, as a developer, when you go to like learn something, I think it's like 98% of, of developers will go to the document docs first. So just having good docs can really, really help uh, regarding on ramping, getting adoption, or you know, a contributing guide. Um, now for like the, the next two with vendor lock-in and, and the idea of like rug pulling. Um, rug pulling sort of became much more of a thing recently uh, with some of the shenanigans from like uh, HashiCorp and like Redis. And both of those things kind of triggered uh, the uh, community forks where the majority of users pivoted to a fork of the project. And honestly, that wouldn't exist if there wasn't a strong invested community that could actually do that. Other big benefit uh, that is overlooked is just being involved with a project uh, clues you in much earlier than uh, the general public on upcoming issues. Um, so who here actually remembers uh, Kubernetes removing Docker shim? Okay, not quite as many as I thought. <laughs> uh, how about people that have dealt with the um, registry migration and all that um, last year? A little bit more, anyway. So those things were discussed in the project way earlier before it was announced to the public. So you buy yourself and your company additional lead time just by being involved and being able to keep up with some of the news that's happening inside the project itself. The other thing is like on the security side, who remembers the um, XZ, I think it was XZ backdoor, like 
the only way that got discovered was from a random Microsoft employee that got really annoyed with the performance of the, th the thing that was in there and basically dove in and discovered it himself. We've seen other private companies where things have been developed inside that you know, tend to get exploited or things discovered, um, not necessarily much more easily, but it goes unknown and can be exploited for a while before it's, it's really surfaced. <clears throat> So honestly, there's like, there's a lot more to this, um, but now I kind of want to dive into the cost side. So in a separate study from UC Berkeley measuring the economic value of open source software, they found that uh, many reported that it would actually cost about four times the amount to say, develop an internal equivalent or go with a vendored solution. And those are, you know, kind of general facts, but it doesn't give us like some concrete things that you can actually look at. Um, so when you start to look deeper at, you know, the issues you create and who fixes them, uh, you like you will happen to have like you'll frequently uh, come across where like they're actually fixed by others and not people in your own organization. And I actually want to highlight an example of this. Um, that I covered actually from my talk at KubeCon Paris. So if you were there, I'm sorry, it's gonna be a repeat of a story. But I was connected with a end user company. Uh, this is actually before I joined the CNCF uh, that was contributing to several open source projects. Um, all the maintainers of it, um, or sorry, they, and they were maintainers of several projects of the things that they were using in their stack. And they were actually critical in places of their stack. But despite that, they were getting significant pressure from leadership to cut back and drop uh, fully, uh, cut back or drop fully their upstream engagement to work on more impactful things. So I had asked what they had done previously and what they had reported to leadership. And they listed out what they use, what they contribute to. Uh, they had pulled some stats to show like their presence in the project, like, you know, they're a number two contributor, things like that. They also included, um, what features they were driving, um, yeah, what features they're driving upstream that they were using. But some of this is, I actually consider a trap that I see people fall into. Uh, they use stats and information that are easy to generate, like the number of contributions they've made. They don't think to gather more information to try and actually convey the right message to leadership. Um, so the bug statistics one, on the right side <laughs> um, is stats from one of the projects that they were maintainers of. I like to use bug fixes when discussing these things because it reads to, relates to overall stability and it's something uh, generally everyone understands without having to go uh, deep on something. So in the previous year, 11 were submitted by them. Only six of the 11 were fixed by employees of that same organization. In the meantime, for those fixes to be reviewed, merged, and a release cut was a little less than three days, uh, which happened to be dramatically faster than anything that they were doing internally. <clears throat> so I asked them, the next thing was I asked them seriously, how much time do they actually spend on projects in a given month? And for this one, this specific project. It turns out it actually wasn't a lot because this project was fairly uh, mature. And of those six engineers, it was only about 10%. So really they were like, you know, 48 hour, four to eight hours, like a month. So when looking at this and trying to sell the story of, so they, for roughly the cost of half a software engineer, 0.6 SWEs, they were getting the features they wanted. They were getting their bugs fixed with half of them being done by other people that weren't employees of their own organization. And they were getting uh, fixed and patches released cut faster than anyone else in, was doing internally. And that sort of information presented uh, to leadership went over wonderfully. Um, so like what we went on from there is we kind of like went through a lot of their other projects, at least their, their critical ones, and did the same sort of exercise. And at that point, when leadership understood that for their investment in time, their software engineers, plus some of the resources that they had donated for them, like testing, um, they were getting a significant return just by letting their engineers spend roughly like 20% of their time in open source. And that's the kind of conveying message that works really well. So 
going back to them, the big problem what they had is they didn't have a good strategy. They were encouraged to work on open source and, you know, sort of participate in the community, um, help do things, but they weren't doing a good job of keeping track of it and conveying the value of that in a way that was um, useful to leadership. Um, and this is why, like, even for end users, I highly, highly recommend developing a strategy and think about how your contributions align with your goals. The same can be said for vendors. It's pretty much the same thing. The big thing with this, again, is thinking about how you convey the impact in a way that the other teams in your organization understand. What is it that they really care about? And being able to frame your contributions and why you're getting involved in open source around that will make sure that you have a very successful journey. So that. Yeah, and that's basically the end. Um, so the conclusion is uh, there is real value in contributing to open source. And uh, each company basically needs to define this in their open source strategy. They need a strategy. That's obviously the second conclusion. So because otherwise it's just going wild and you cannot f put it to KPIs. Um, and it will basically, it will quantify everything that you will do in, uh, in the in investment in open source will quantify manifold because you will always get more out of it. And the last thing, and that's probably the most important thing is marketing whatever you can out of this. And this is not like the B shit marketing. It's like the just say what you do because that's the, the message that you that is enough to, to convey. Yeah. If you do bullshit marketing, someone's going to call call you out on it at some exactly. point. Exactly. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you're interested, uh, we run a new contributor orientation meeting every third Tuesday in two different times for the Kubernetes project, where we basically explain how Kubernetes as a project works, how you can, can, can get into this. And um, thanks for being here. Uh, and if you have questions, yeah. we are happy to answer them. If you need help on developing your own sort of strategy for engaging this stuff, like please reach out. This is something we've spent a lot of time actually doing and helping organizations um, go through and have a successful engagement. Yeah. Any questions? There's a mic. <laughs> hey, uh, Bob, it's me again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Richard from Ant Group. We are one of the end users of uh, uh, CNCF and uh, like projects and Kubernetes. So if you can maybe go back one slide. Yes, uh, so I realized that basically you talk through everything, but then the uh, green circle has been particularly, there's actually a jump of steps of the green circle. Uh, in fact, I think that's one of the most important aspects in which we're trying to quantify the investment to, to align with the business goals. We talked about that at the very beginning. We have some numbers and the numbers are associated with either the, the cost of the engineers or the cost of their contribution. But in the later analysis, that part seems to be particularly missing. So what I'm curious about is um, once we do have a strategy, so let's say that you know, we identify the projects, like four or five projects in which we want to contribute to, how can we quantify that using maybe the bugs or the metrics and the impact levels with the triage data to really help align with business goals? Do we have any I would say like intels or examples for that? Um, I do have stuff for that not in this deck. Mm -hmm. um, I will have another deck for a presentation next week that I break a lot of this down in a lot more detail. Um, mm -hmm. But I go over how to classify features within a project, whether it's worth investment, um, looking at things being developed by others that you can get a benefit from, uh, from like, helping essentially push their, their features and things like that through, uh, breaking things down into different KPIs and different ways to evaluate um, sort of engagements in projects and potential engagements in projects to help build that story. I see. Is that going to be a part of the member summit? Yes. Okay. I'll see you there. Oh, mm -hmm. sweet. Bye. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. How do we attend the session next week? Huh? The session next week, you said. Oh. Uh, 
that one is at the Linux Foundation Member Summit. Uh, if you're attending that, the talk is called um, Chasing the White Whale of Open Source, ROI. Hi, uh, two questions for you. I couldn't see the slides on the, uh, you know, on the sketch. Uh, will those be available anywhere for download? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, just later on there. And then the other one was: so I work for a company where we, our open source footprint is rather small right now, but uh, very successful. <laughs> um, and uh, this has been an interesting talk. The struggle, the question I have is: you know, we don't really. You know, I, I'm looking to build out a strategy to bring to management and say, "Hey, this is useful," right? But we don't have a lot of contributions or anything else right now, right? We know the value of it, but there's been kind of this push not to contribute, right? There's this, been this push to say, no, you know, I don't see the value in it, right? So just stay on company stuff. Um, how successful is it, as, you know, has it been in, you know, uh, in doing a pitch like that, you know, for a company that, that doesn't have any, you know, data of their own, right? And then being able to go to a company and say, well, you know, going to our own management with, with nothing, essentially say, we should be doing this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there is, um, actually, there is on the, uh, it's, it's either the Linux Foundation or the CNCF side, there is like how to build an open source strategy for your company. And there's uh, already data in it, um, like uh, from different CEOs, from end user companies and from, uh, from yeah, vendor companies. And uh, this is something that you basically can pull in, in into the uh, statistics. But as Bob mentioned, also uh, CNCF is usually always open to jump into a discussion there and help to build decks. Okay. Yeah. The other thing with that is when trying to pick what projects you want to invest in, that's like worthy of you know allocating potential time to do so. That's where I like to look at um, essentially like project health and potential like potential opportunities. Um, what opportunities are there in the project for you to do something that might benefit your company? Um, or looking at, you know, risk and the, you know, okay, uh, looking at the risk for the project in terms of what happens if that project collapses? Um, is it difficult for you to switch to something else? What, what's, how much time do you estimate that would take? Or in other project health metrics, um, how healthy is the project itself? How many, uh, what's the diversity of the companies? What's the, like how many maintainers are active in there? And if it's not healthy, that's where you can, you know, potentially engage and make it healthy again with your contributions, which de-risks your own usage. Okay, thank you.